Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Open Minds Circle Elite Executive Roundtable, Best Practices to Break Racial Barriers and Address Structural Racism, the Presley Ridge Case Study. I'm Stacey Fox, and I'm with the Open Minds Market Intelligence Team, and I'd like to introduce you to Suzanne Cole, President and CEO of Presley Ridge, located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Suzanne was appointed president and CEO in 2011 and oversees all strategic leadership, the fiscal, operational, and administrative management of Presley Ridge. She joined the team in 1990 and has served as the executive director for their West Virginia and, Divi and Virginia divisions. She has been senior vice president of programs and chief operating officer. She's developed expertise in strategic planning, board governance, management and leadership development, financial planning, program operations, marketing and communications, quality improvement, and fundraising and development. Today's session is being moderated by Ray Wolf, an Open Mind Senior Associate with over 40 years of experience in the health and human services sector. His expertise includes financial analysis and management, mergers and acquisitions, performance improvement, and strategic planning. Ray has spent 22 years with Pittsburgh Mercy Health Systems in Pittsburgh prior to joining our Open Minds team. Before we get started, a few housekeeping reminders. Your audio will be muted during today's briefing. However, we encourage you to submit any questions you may have using the question box on the right side of your screen, and we will present them to Suzanne at the end. The slides and recording from today's briefing will be available on the Open Minds website starting tomorrow. Ray, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Suzanne, can we flip slide? We're trying, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. There we go. This is an interesting topic for me. Mostly the presentations I've done for Open Minds have been business oriented, finance oriented, and strategy oriented, and, and haven't dealt with a lot of social issues. But this one I feel touches me a great deal. These last two years have been depressing, uh, a little overwhelming, filled with anxiety. Uh, it's more than COVID. There is a problem in this country that we have not faced, uh, that we have not addressed correctly. And now in our isolation from each other, we are left solely to look at it and deal with it face to face for the first time. The issues of structural racism blew up in this last two years with names that have become famous, uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery. We watched on TV as young men took assault rifles and wandered into the center of cities to defend the, their property. And we worried as juries looked at evidence and wondered how they would perceive it based on their own prejudices and ideas and thoughts. All in all, what my feeling has been is that what previously was a moral imperative for many of us has become a social necessity for all of us. Let's switch the slides. I really feel that our market hasn't done everything we could. We haven't taken um, this as seriously as we could, and we haven't moved ahead in any way that makes a noticeable difference in the lives of the people we serve or the communities we serve. And for all of us, that lies in our mission statement. I found one study, uh, Hyden Hopkins performed it for the Journal of Ethnics and Cultural Diversity. It's more than 16 years old, but it pointed out that Racial and gender segregation occurred in organizations that were overwhelmingly white and female, that the strategies that were being promoted were a little bit like advertising and marketing is more than actual projects to change the nature of the way work was being done. And the public welfare agencies 
often were the weakest in developing these diversity climates. We don't need to do great things. There are plenty of places in our environment where small changes, small steps in the right way can lead us to a correct path for, from this issue. But as we face this crisis of models and structure, of the need for innovation and moving ahead, we need to start realizing that addressing the issues of institutional and structural racism are more than just important moral imperatives for our community. Let's move to the next slide and I'll, I'll point that out. I, I note in this that a 19, 2019 study by McKinsey created some really interesting evidence about innovation and the quality of the workforce in various companies. And they looked at top quartile companies who were good at ethnic and cultural diversity, were among the best in the country, the top quarter. And they found those companies were 36% more profitable than companies in the lower court. They found as well that that number had grown from 2017 and that huge 36% gap that exists between those who are the most diverse and those who are the least diverse was actually beginning to widen. But yet, when they looked at executive teams, they found that only 13% had representation. Now, this isn't where majority representation, this was had any representation at all. That to me uh, speaks very heavily about the issues that we're, we're addressing right now in terms of the needs of our community and the needs of the people we serve. So let me end then with my final slide so I can have Suzanne take over and begin to tell you about the amazing things that they've accomplished at Presley Ridge. Because um, the benefits strategically for our organizations, if we were to promote this path, are substantial. And they are logical benefits in addition to doing what's right, living with that moral imperative. We see that from the study by McKinsey, that more diverse work groups bring different skills, different talents, different experiences. They boost creativity and innovation as a result of the work they do. Um, they create for your company a brand which is unique and different and which appeals to the younger population, the millennials and the Gen Z workers who believe in the ideas of social responsibility and diversity for business. We need those people in our workforce and this becomes a brand identity to draw them. Diverse teams also create a great deal of collaboration and those collaborations yield uh, team unity and, and ideas of working together which extend beyond the boundaries of the workforce. When we look at the people we serve, we see that a large number of them, and the pandemic taught us this, are not being served correctly because they don't have access. And part of those barriers are perceived prejudices in the way we do business that we sometimes subconsciously create and sometimes we, by our lack of effort, allow to exist. It is amazing to me in a time frame when every CEO I know is screaming about the need for recruiting, that we have persons in our community who would be great at the jobs we do, and they won't come to us because of the way they perceive us, because of the images of us that we've allowed to be created. So I would, I would raise this issue as critically important to us on several levels. On the moral and spiritual level, most definitely, but also on the level of 
creativity, a business, the brand of your company, your ability to recruit, your ability to serve the correct people in the correct way. And I think all of that plays into why this is important. When I've talked about other exec to other execs about this, um, what I've gotten is not people who are opposed to it, but people who don't know where to begin and who think that another huge project is simply impossible in this time frame. The work that Suzanne did at Presley Ridge and the way they've developed is really, to me, a true statement of the importance of evolution of a company and the need to do small things frequently rather than to build a big project with a lot of communication blitz around it. And I, I don't want to waste any more time on the introduction to this because I want Suzanne to share her story. So Suzanne, great seeing you again. Good being in contact with a fellow Pittsburgher and a fellow Mountaineer from West Virginia. So I um, appreciate it and feel free to begin. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for that kind introduction, Stacy, as well. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, Ray gave a great background to what we're gonna talk about here. And, and really, you know, I titled this Presley Ridge's Journey to Racial Equity because it is a journey. We were having conversation yesterday. This is not about kind of checking a box that we've attended a training or we have statements on our website. This is about an evolution of an organization and a journey to make sure that we are an equitable organization and we are doing our best in our community to champion equity for those that we serve. You know, I'm gonna, Presley Ridge, as we mentioned, you know, we're headquartered here in Pittsburgh, but we're in six states. So there's a lot of diversity in who we serve in the communities in which we work. We have, you know, five different service lines, 70 plus programs and about 1,100 employees. And we've always had this commitment to data-driven approaches and quality outcomes. But what you'll find as we go through this presentation is that there are some things that we are absolutely missing. Um, as we started the journey to think about racial equity, really what impacted me was a trip that I took to Ferguson when um, the murder had occurred there, the shooting of the police officer to the 18 year old. And listening to the community and hearing some of the things behind the scenes that were happening and then thinking about the folks that we serve, the people of color that we serve, and what kind of a job were we doing here um, to make sure that Presley Ridge was paying attention to issues in our community, um, as well as the, the feelings and the trauma and everything else that people of color were experiencing that we serve. So this slide, um, this is actually from Casey Family Services, and I'm not gonna, it's, it's little, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but I would encourage you um, to take a look at it for your organization because it talks about, you know, how you start from this emerging colorblind approach to get to a racial equity approach, and it does give you some very clear things to do. What I will tell you is that Presley Ridge is not, we're not all the way over to the racial equity approach yet. We're, we're in between race tentative and racial equity with our goal of getting to the racial equity approach. But I put it up here because as Ray mentioned, I do hear time and time again, we just don't know what to do. We don't know where to start. This kind of helps you evaluate where your organization is and then gives you some key things you can do more, moving forward. Um, so I just, you know, I wanted to add that in for folks just to take a look at. But as we think about our journey, um, we actually started because we were connected with a consultant here in Allegheny County who couldn't join us today, but her name is Joyce James. Um, and some folks went through her training that were here in Pittsburgh as providers. And then she came on to Presley Ridge as a contracted individual to help us kind of frame out what our journey was gonna be. And we talk about this groundwater analysis, and this was a workshop. Um, and really I call it an experience because it's not, a presentation like this. It's actually an experience with your colleagues in a room, sitting in a circle. But the whole workshop was this basis for analyzing racial inequities and how they intersect between public and private institutions, housing, education, everything that you see here. And the workshop was really designed to give a clearer understanding of the role of leadership in systems and institutions in how we work together to develop this racial equity lens. 
with the goal of strengthening our staff performance, which obviously impacts the kids and families that we're serving, um, and increasing our programmatic success in reducing racial inequities. We chose institutional structural racism um, to address that because we believe that the barriers within the systems and institutions in which we work, the policies, procedures, regulations, those are the things that allow racism to continue. Yes, there are individuals that you know um, promote racism, but unless we address it in a in a policy, procedural, institutional, structural manner, we won't see significant change. That's at least our belief system. So what we did was this groundwater analysis workshop, we did the experience for all of our leadership staff, including myself, as well as our board. And yes, you go through the experience afterwards, you kind of debrief the session because it is highly um, emotional and it really makes you think. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we've always been a data-driven organization, but we started looking at our data differently. And, um, you know, it was almost kind of the aha moment and a little probably embarrassing to us that even though we've looked at data for years and years and years, um, and we have our annual report like everyone else, and in the annual report is when we start to look at, you know, age and race and sex and all the demographics of those that we're serving. But what we weren't doing was taking our outcomes data and disaggregating it by race to see how different populations were doing. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, the importance around that. We also, um, after leadership went through the groundwater analysis workshop, all of our staff went through it. They all debriefed it. There were lots of conversations. Feedback came from those groups back to the leadership team. And then we started focus groups for kids, parents, and foster parents um, in the same manner that we were doing the groundwater analysis and how things were impacting them. All of that data came back to us. And what we started doing was looking at disaggregating our data by race. Here's the reason why. Here's what we know, right? Disproportionality exists across systems, and you see it in every system and every institution. Presley Ridge is an institution, healthcare is an institution, education, all of the things that are on the screen. And what you see here are some statistics that should make us all want to check ourselves and think about the reason why we want to address disproportionality. You know, we already know that in healthcare, African Americans are 2.3 times more likely to experience infant death. We have education statistics about African Americans are 3.7 more times more likely to be suspended in K through 12. In the justice system, 2.7 times more likely to be searched on a traffic stop, 7.0 times more likely to be incarcerated as adults. Child welfare, 1.8 times more likely to be identified as victims, and 2.1 times more likely to be to, to enter the foster care system. For things that white children aren't removed from their homes um, to be placed in foster care for, and so these are this is the reason why we started looking at at you know our data. Here's what we wanted to do, you know why why? So you have to ask yourself the question and you have to share with your staff why are we going to do this? Um, because we do want to find these hidden trends. We want to look at areas of program development, and we want to always improve what we're doing. So program effectiveness and equity is important to us. These were the data sources that we looked at by race across the organization. So all of our outcomes of our clients that were discharged, our service line level outcomes of discharged clients, our regional outcomes, our satisfaction surveys, restraints in our education programs, treatment foster care, length of stay and adoptions in our West Virginia residential programs versus treatment foster care youth served, looking to see who, who are in those programs and how do they come to be in those programs, as well as human resource data. So we didn't do this all at once. This has been a progression over time. We actually started with our outcomes data of kids and families and then moved in some, into some of these other categories. And so here's the reason why. Typically what we would do in a quality improvement meeting or um, you know, in a management meeting is look at our aggregated outcomes. So you would see something like this. This is just an example of one of the quarters. You'd see something like this, right? Two things we wanted to look at, living with family or independently, showing positive change and growth, and that would be on a standardized assessment. So how are we doing? How are we doing regionally? 
some of these scores look pretty good, 86%, 84%. You know, we like to see the 80s and higher. So this gives us a, a picture of how we think our clients are doing in each one of these regions. All right. Now when we look at it disaggregated, here's what we see. And as you look at this screen, go down. So the categories at the top are Western Pennsylvania, Central Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland and Delaware, Ohio, and then the organization. And then at the very bottom in black, you see the overall region's percentage. And what we want is to be better than that region's percentage and to increase that and improve over time. So what you see is if you look at the first column underneath Western Pennsylvania, you start to see that the overall region's percentage in living with family or independently is 86%. And then look above that. Um, you know, we start to see that, you know, African Americans, 81%, it's not a horrible score, but it's not 86%. Go to the next category, it's 77%. The next category, 63%, 79, 81. What we start to see is Black and African American youth that we serve, their scores, aside from Maryland and Delaware, are, you know, a little lower than what we see in the rest of the region. Um, we also see, if you go to the next one on positive change and growth, something similar. And positive change and growth, like I said, is a standardized assessment. And so if you think about kind of historically how standardized assessments have been normed, they're normed with white children. And so we start to see some disparities here. We also see by multiracial, it's not doing too well with those populations. What we see is that we, we were doing much better with white kids than what we were with children of color. And that was, you know, really kind of an eye-opening moment. It was disappointing for us, um, but being completely transparent, what do we want to do? We want to fix it. And this is the reason why we disaggregate our data by race and by region. And we'll talk a little bit more about this kind of later in some other slides. But my point here is that if we just looked at the aggregate data, I might say, oh, this is great. We're doing really well. But we're doing well for some populations. We're not doing well for all whom we serve that we have a responsibility to help be successful. And that's the, the point of the disaggregation. When we also look at disproportionality, um, there are ratios, our research team does all this and I'll just get to share it with you. But um, when we talk about disproportionality, um, the likelihood, it's the likelihood of experiencing a negative outcome compared to certain group or groups of people. So and whenever you have a risk ratio around 1.5, it's considered concerning. Risk ratios above two indicate significant disproportionality. So we also took a look at um, some of our programs using this, this kind, of, kind of risk ratio. One of the things that we found were that in, in, in the education system in general, and I encourage you to look this up, you will see that disciplinary action, restraints, um, going to higher levels of care is one of the things that we see happening to Black and African American students. Um, what we found was also that in our schools, and it didn't matter the make, we have five different schools, um, Black and African American students are 2.65 times more likely to be restrained than white youth. Now, that was really, really concerning. As we dug deeper into the data, it also didn't matter um, the race of the staff. It didn't matter if the staff were white, black, Hispanic. It, it, we still saw that they were restraining children 2.65 times more likely than a white youth. So you start to ask yourself some questions there. Um, and it's the reason for the focus groups, it's the reason for the groundwater analysis around institutional and structural racism and, and how our beliefs um, have kind of gotten ingrained in our systems, but also how they've impacted us and our bias. One of the things that we did was um, our research team began looking at um, how are we going to dig deeper into our cases? And they actually developed a tool called an equity tracer. And this equity tracer looks at youth experiences based on outcomes. Um, we looked at the lived experience of those we serve. We identify areas of systemic bias. And then, you know, how do we improve our services for diverse individuals? They did a lot of literature research on behavioral health, healthcare outcomes that are worse for ethnic minorities, 
and how they're, um, the outcomes are often linked to service professionals or systems level bias. These are the areas in which the literature identified seven forms of, bi of bias. So systems framing, all the systems that someone is, is you know, involved in, family involvement, the language that we use, access or service utilization, treatment type, termination of services, and a working alliance. And some of these won't surprise you. I mean, some of what we found when we did some of these equity tracers were that children of color weren't offered the same resources as white children at, in the prevention stages. We also saw that removals happen more quickly for um, children of color than white children for things like um, inadequate supervision, not necessarily abuse and neglect. And the inadequate supervision term is kind of loosely defined, um, and it, it's something that's caused a lot of problems. Um, we've seen language used in cases of children that, um, particularly African American kids, that we wouldn't use for a white child. We've seen, you know, kind of opinions formed without data to back it up. Um, and we've seen kids go, you know, a, 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 a white child and an African-American child commit the same type of behavior um, and the African-American child go instantly into more of a corrections type setting than a treatment setting. So all of these things we were kind of looking at. Same thing with termination of services. Services being terminated or ending without additional supports. We saw more of that happening with children of color, African-American children, than we did of Caucasian children. So we took a look at all of these cases and dug in, and there were, we, we did this just kind of sample pilot in three states. In, in 22 of these tracers, between February and April, what we found were that all the tracers or non-white individuals had some potential evidence of structural racism 100% of the time. And so that's really kind of enlightening too especially as we start to think about we are one institution amongst many so how do we begin to address some of this and before i go into the human resource data piece because there's two pieces of this right one is our work with kids and families and how we start to change and look at things through a racial equity lens and then the other is our staffing makeup but what i will say when i was showing you some of the data about you know the education service line as well as our outcomes data what we had to do then is take these equity tracers and dig deeper into the cases and start to ask some questions and do the focus groups with staff, do the focus groups with teachers and um, the caseworkers and the parents and the kids, and then start to identify the places in which you know we can make definite improvements for the future. And again, it's about looking at things through a racial equity lens, but then it's also about taking action to break down barriers. And I'll give you a quick example um, in the school system in which we were working um, in a public school system. And there was an incident in which um, two children had the same type of behavior occur. And the police were called on the African-American child, but not on the white child. They were gonna take the African-American child to corrections. And obviously we needed to intervene in this and make the case for why that that wasn't appropriate. Now, you, everybody thinks that's kind of easy, right? But it, it, it really wasn't. It took some um, serious advocating on our part. And it also took us showing some data to that school system about what we had seen happening over the course of time. And, and I say that because this has to be a collaborative process. This can't be a blaming process. This is about how do we work together to make change within systems and institutions? How do we break down, you know, the, the biases, the the barriers, the disciplinary procedures, the whatever you want to call it, that really continue to perpetuate institutional and structural racism. So I'm going to just stop there for a second because it was a lot on the kids and families um, that I wanted to show you with the point being that looking at the data disaggregated by race led us down different paths for more information to which then we could put interventions in place to make adjustments and improvements on not only our trainings, but clinical supervision, administrative supervision, addressing some of the biases that we saw where we could have control internally as well as externally. So Ray, I don't know if you have any questions or if anyone else does, I'll stop before we go into the human resource piece of this. 
I have several that I'd, I'd like to ask. Um, just, you know, my first reaction to, to the data issues is um, always the, the old operations person of how long will it take to get this developed? Where do we, what will we need to gather? Yada, yada. How do we build the reports? And this strikes me as really, really fairly easy. I, I think almost every organization presently gathers racial data as part of its requirement to the state or the county or some governmental entity for funding. But we have never used that data field as a sort to review our outcomes or to review the kind of treatments we're providing. So when I think about structuring a system like this, it doesn't feel very difficult from a technology point of view. It seems like something that uh, even in a time of stress or, or difficulty for our technology departments, they have our reports ready reasonably quickly. The, the second stage of making it part of the culture seems to be more difficult. Where did you review this data? Uh, how did you get people focused or engaged in using the data or considering it part of your quality system? Um, what was the regularity of it? It's a good question. Um, and I will tell you that the, our first reaction always when we see something that is less than what we want it to be, right? When we don't get the score on the test that we want is, well, that can't be right. <laughs> How is that possible? That must, we have to go back and, and rerun the reports. Right. We had, we had a lot of that. We had some of that. And, and part of that, obviously, is because I do believe that in this profession, we are all here to help. We all want to make things better. We all feel like we treat everyone fairly um, and that we're doing that on a daily basis all the time. And so it was hard for, we started with leadership and we looked at it and then we tried to rip it all apart, right? Because we wanted it to be better. But the data is the data. You cannot, you know, the numbers are the numbers. But you do have to dig below the numbers and you do have to talk with people to get kind of a better picture of what's going on and how you're going to address it. And, you know, especially when you look at the, like, when I showed you the numbers on the education service line, that started with leadership, started with who runs our schools, and really only one school was having more of an issue with it than our other schools. And so with, we had to share it with their leadership team in the school talk to their staff about it in a way that is non-threatening in the sense that, you know, we're not coming at you, but we're wanting to, to kind of solve this, this problem together. And we want to make you aware of what's going on. And really, when you take that approach, you know, when people feel like they're not going to get in trouble for something um, and that we're just, we're, we're sharing data, we're being transparent because we all want to do better. And when we know better, we do better. So let's talk about this. You know, then we could have conversation because then you could have Seth saying, you know what? Yes, yes, I can see where, um, you know, in some cases it was, again, people understanding and recognizing that what we have been socialized to think can actually impact our actions. You see a group of white kids together. You see a group of African Americans kids together. Some people's biases, I feel like that's a gang. You know, the black kids are a gang, they're gonna hurt me, whatever. You have to be able to be courageous enough to, to say that and to have those open conversations to then be able to address it and to dig down into, you know, why, why do you feel that? What behaviors were they exhibiting that made you feel unsafe if you're a staff person? What, and really getting to it um, and then really kind of involving everybody in the process to improve things um, and also talking to the kids about how it makes them feel um, and how they felt by the way in which staff have treated them. So it, it really is lots of communication, lots of conversation, lots of openness and transparency about we have this and we want to improve. We want to do better by you. We want to do better by our children of color. Um, and you, we want you to help us. So help us learn, help us understand. Did your quality improvement team at the company take a ownership of this or was it strictly through the leadership yeah they did but here's the thing what i say all the time is everybody wants the quality improvement team to own it that it's their data well it's actually the program's data 
and they're just running the reports for us. Um, but what we did was, yes, we did monthly meetings, we did quarterly meetings, and our quality improvement team facilitated those conversations. And we also used the consultant a lot at the beginning because we want people to be open and honest. And sometimes that helps with an outside consultant. And so um, Dr. James participated in a lot of these sessions with our staff to really get at the core of what was occurring in the belief systems. Um, and so between our quality improvement team, our consultant, um, and the program staff, that's how we were able to manage this. But we started with leadership in those programs and with quality improvement, but then it has to go all the way down to the staff that are doing direct intervention with kids and families. I'm glad you mentioned the, the issue of um, the first response to any report that is slightly negative is generally the report's wrong, the data's no good. <laughs> Um, that that's been a traditional forever, and I, I understand it because that's the response of people who take a great deal of pride and interest in their work and who believe they're doing a good job. Um, yeah. If the issue we're facing is subjective, they may really not understand or feel the problem at all until it's presented in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would be worried, given my bull in a china shop kind of approach to life, about making people feel fault um, or guilty for that, when in fact that's not the case. It, did you run into issues of that with your staff and leadership, and how did you address that? Yes, everybody felt that way, that, um, you know, really we addressed that through kind of using the consultant helping us get there there are two things that i think were really important for us one is that we've always tried to promote that you know we are we have a culture of quality improvement and so yes do we want to celebrate what's great absolutely but we can't ignore what we the areas that we don't do well in and so and we're always going to face challenges and so we have to be the best problem solvers that we can and we have to have a belief that 99.9% .9 of the time, everyone's trying to do the right thing. And that's how we lead off, that we do believe people are trying to do the right thing. And I do believe that within our organization. Um, we don't always succeed, but I do believe that 99.9% .9 of the time, people are trying to do the right thing. The other thing that the consultant kind of leaded, you know, led with, and we talk about a lot is, she made people feel very comfortable about this is historical. This isn't yesterday, today, this, this is a historical problem. And what she constantly said, and I use it a lot, is, you know, we didn't build the house, but we live in it. And so how can we make improvements to get it to be the structure that we want it to be? And so I think it's it's acknowledging and recognizing that we are influenced by all kinds of different things in our in our world. Media influences are strong. Social media influences are strong. We're conditioned to certain things that we see you know, it wasn't too long ago that I was looking at a, um, a CPR first aid um, kind of flyer that people hand out. And if, if you're going to go through a CPR first aid class for life-saving, like life lifeguarding programs, you know, you have all this material. And in your material was this chart that, or this, this pictorial of a swimming pool. And, you know, it showed kind of what people were doing. Well, typically I would just look at that, no big deal, right? Set it aside. In this case, and it was purposeful, I, you know, the consultant had us really look into it and really take a strong, hard look at it. And when you did, what you saw was the white kids were either lifeguards or helpers. The black kids were getting in trouble in the pool or getting disciplined. Now, I, my brain probably didn't even register that years ago. You know, and so, again, things get into your brain. You get a picture. It. it takes a hold and then you form some type of an opinion about it and you move on but you think about that historically people probably remember the um the study that was done with white baby dolls and black baby dolls with four-year-olds and giving them a choice and and you know parents that said they didn't teach their children um racist principles but the majority of children chose the white baby doll if given the choice and when you listen to them talk they talk about the black baby doll being dirty or being bad or whatever. And again, parents were taken aback and shocked by that. Um, but again, history, think about, you know, historically, think about, um, you know, in my 50s, um, think about, I think about even textbooks. Did we have children of color in textbooks or in children's storybooks growing up? 
all of these things influenced us. And when we did, what did we see? What do we see on crime television? What do we hear about? I still get aggravated when there are crime shows on and somebody's doing, you know, somebody's committing a crime and it's always the kid in foster care. And a lot of times it's the black kid in foster care. And so again, it's like, it's forming, you know, our brain is listening to that, seeing that and forming an opinion. And we have to be sensitive to that. But I think the approach of, you know, historically things have impacted us, we have to be more aware of them and we have to change them for the future. Um, and that, you know, we didn't build the house, but we live in it. And now we're going to make improvements to the house and get us in the structure that we want along with we do believe that people in this field in our organizations are trying to do the right thing and so when we see problems we just have to call them out and address them um, without making it the individual person's problem this is about institutional and structural racism and how do we address that within our systems and improve that's a really interesting point about growing up with this background that you don't even understand where your pre uh, prejudices came from. I, mm -hmm. I remember in high school, for example, that uh, there were certain sports that you could or could not attend based on your on your race, racial background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Hispanics were solely into baseball, and that's it. Um, the coach was Hispanic, and that was the only place that a, a Hispanic child felt comfortable. Uh, the same was true with with uh, African Americans in the football team, and mm -hmm. and it it really um, creates. It's really interesting when you step back from your own life and see where your own subconscious issues have come from. I I was really interested, and I'll I'll just reference this once that the slide earlier on where you talked about the evolution beginning at one point and and ending with racial equity mm -hmm. that almost like a self-assessment. Mm -hmm. Did you take that as a group or with the board or the executive team? And and was that really the beginning place for kind of building this plan? We did take it as a leadership team. We did it as an executive leadership team. We did it as a, an organizational leadership team across all of the states. Their supervisors took it and their staff took it and we compared because it's very interesting because a lot of times, you know, you can have this um, gap between what leadership thinks and what, you know, people doing direct care think. And so it was really important for everybody to kind of, you know, see where we were and align there. And we were actually pretty close. But yes, we did a kind of a self-assessment with that, Ray. And, and then from there, um, in our work with our consultant, we started to kind of build up you know, what we think, you know, how we, how can we get to um, the far side of that, which is the racial equity um, approach on that chart. And again, you, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. That's why this is a journey. We're still not there. We started this work in about 2014, 2015, and we're still not there. So we're getting there. It's, but, but I've, I said this before to Ray yesterday that, you know, the goal here is that um, it's not just a few people that are champions around this and it's not an initiative. This is about systems change than our own organization. So it has to live beyond me, beyond my board, beyond the current leadership. And so that type of change is going to take time because we have to change practice, training, policies, procedures, anything that we think creates um, you know, uh, some type of bias, bias within the work that we're doing. Um, so, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. And we should probably go on to the HR piece since we're getting yes. close to time. So let me just, so let me just shift gears for a second um, and talk about human resource data. So in order to accomplish this, you know, we also have to take a look at who are the people that we're employing? How are we matching our youth and family population um, demographics with those that are working with them. And so we started, you know, slicing and dicing some human resource data. And I'm just going to kind of go quickly through this to give you an idea of some of the things that we look at. So we look at who applies to Presley Ridge by race. That's the first kind of basic step. And, you know, you can look at the numbers here and you can have this presentation later, but it's obviously a choice they have to choose. But this is who applies to the organization. And I think it goes to Ray's point before about 
you know, who do you want to apply to the organization? Um, we want everybody to apply. I want everyone to feel comfortable applying. Um, so how are we marketing ourselves? So I'll just leave it there. Then we look at hires by race. This is 18, 19, and 20, and the rate of hire. You know, what percentage of white people are we hiring, Hispanic people, African-American people are we hiring that have applied? So we just take a look at it, and data is data. We look at hires by region by race. So in, in certain areas, you know, you'll see on here, West Virginia and Virginia, that state in general doesn't have a high population of African-American or people of color. You can see there's more white um, folks that there are hired. Delaware and Maryland has a higher proportion of African-American people of color that we serve, but also that we hire. So you, you, you kind of just kind of see what the data is. We look at staff by region, by race, and compare years. And then we also look, and this is the piece that's really important, our clients by race. So if you look here, as of 7-31-2020, our staff demographics were 73% Caucasian and white, 20% African American, black, and 7% other. If you look at 2020 um, on the um, client side of things, you know, we still see we have about 50 some percent um, that we're serving that are white. We have probably close to 30 percent black. And then we have the other category that has actually um, uh, gotten to be about, I think, 25 percent. So what we're trying to do here is match um, as best we can our staff demographics with those that we serve. And, and that's what we're paying attention to over time. The big aha moment for us, though, came in this slide right here. When we, I'm going to, oops, sorry. Um, this was about how do we look at our demographics by race and leadership. So our leadership positions are director and above, but we've really taken this down at this point in time to supervisor and above. And what you see here is the majority of folks in leadership positions were Caucasian and white. And that's been consistent you know over time and so for us the big aha moment was why is that what are we doing or what are we not doing that doesn't attract more diversity at the leadership level and so we've put some initiatives in place and this is this is an area that we're really going to work on because where it starts is you know obviously i mean i'm the ceo and i have to set the direction this is part of our strategic plan but I probably hire six people in this organization, seven maybe if I'm lucky. The majority of our hires in leadership positions are below me in the director level or supervisory level. And what we need to do is make sure that we have things in place to actually ensure that diversity and, and is, is embraced and that any barriers that we have put in place to allow diverse candidates to move up the chain of command are you know, taken away. So this is this is a big one for us. Here, and I'm gonna, because we're pressed for time, I'm gonna just kind of go into kind of where we are now. Um, where, it's where, it's what you saw. You know, right now, our data disaggregated by race is integrated into each of our regional and organizational quality improvement meetings. We do have an equity committee across the organization. I lead it at this point in time because I wanna make the point that it's that important that the CEO is gonna lead this committee. Um, we, and it's all levels of staff across states and services from the direct care level to the management level. Um, we do have consultation going on right now with human services around policies and practices, both internal and external that create barriers for people of color. And, and Ray, you referenced this earlier, you know, some of the times what we see are some, are some things that are just ridiculous. Like, you know, in order to work in this particular program, you have to have a, a driver's license when you're not transporting kids and families. Yes. I mean, so why do you have to have a driver? So, so some of those barriers, we're really working externally to break those down. That's just a quick little example. Uh, workforce strategies are being developed to increase diversity in administrative positions as well as leadership. We have some follow-up sessions with the consultants scheduled. Clinical reviews are occurring um, through a racial equity lens and we're looking at racial trauma. Um, and then ongoing development of the equity committee uh, within the organization. So part of the equity committee's responsibility is to kind of be the ambassadors and champions to things. 
Um, and to, you know, we're doing diverse hiring panels. So now we're just not having one person interview someone, particularly in leadership um, positions. We're having diversity of the panel um, in order to promote diversity of, you know, applicants and, and people feeling comfortable applying to, to leadership positions. But also because of what, what, what Ray referenced earlier about the successes that you see when you have different people with different experiences um, bringing that to the table. And that's really where we hope to kind of improve things. This Texas model is what we're kind of following, this framework for equity in conjunction with what you saw at the very beginning around the Casey Family Services slide that gets you to racial equity. But really this is about kind of, you know, advancing data-driven strategies, looking at disparities um, and creating, you know, strategies um, to, to eradicate them. Um, developing our leaders so that everybody has, you know, the opportunity to strive for equity in their practice and that we're promoting that. Collaborating across our systems, so looking at networks and coalitions and advocates around, you know, looking to find sustainable solutions across institutional lines. Engaging our community. Um, promoting work defined by racial equity principles. And then really this evaluation and transformation, continuing to improve based upon the information that we have looking at every initiative, program, and policy around um, equity. And I shared this with Ray earlier, I'll share this with you all, that we had an opportunity in another state to um, sell our treatment foster care curriculum to them. And the state wanted the, the um, university that was charged with um, choosing the curriculum to, to give to the providers for free because the state was paying for it. Um, chose Presley Ridge. So we were really excited about the opportunity. And then it went up for approval at the state level and it got denied. And the reason it got denied was because in our training for treatment foster parents, we have a section on institutional and structural racism and it's part of homework that we do. And apparently in the state legislation had been passed that anything related to critical race theory could not be taught to foster parents. Um, and so they came back to us and said, can you just take that piece out of your curriculum? And our answer to that was no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to water down our curriculum to make somebody else feel good. Um, but that is still what we're up against. And so when we start to look at these things, we want systems transformation, as particularly in a category like that, um, because it's not helpful to kids and families, children of color that we're serving. And so we're not going to compromise our values and principles for something like that, just to sell a piece of curriculum to someone. But it gives you an idea that it's still out there, you know, and, and Stacy and Ray and I were talking about this yesterday, just because something's not highlighted on the news does not mean it's still not an issue for us and for our kids and families. And I don't think we can forget that. Here's our work that still needs to be done. We have a lot more collaborating to do, a lot more community engagement, um, still continued evaluation and transformation. I'll give you quick lessons learned. Um, it's a journey. This is definitely a journey. Your board and leadership engagement is critical. Conversations and experiences are emotional and difficult sometimes. That doesn't mean you should not have them. You have to push through them and keep listening and make changes. You have to trust the process. It's not linear. A lot of times we felt like we were going in circles, but then we arrived at the place where we needed to be. And you need to go where the data and feedback takes you. Um, and then you just have to continue to communicate about your efforts, ongoing communication. The more communication, the better. And I'm probably still not as good as what I'd like to be about this across our organization. And then I'll just kind of leave you with this. This is really what we're looking for, right? Equity. So this is the slide on equality versus equity. Some of you may have seen it. Um, and, and what we're going for here is the third image, you know, where everybody can see the game without any supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was addressed. The systemic barrier of the fence was removed. That's what we're shooting for. And that's why this work is so important. And then I'll just leave you with, how do you begin? You just start, just start somewhere. I said this yesterday, we're not perfect. We made mistakes along the way. We'll continue to make mistakes in our future. Um, but it was important to start and we're going to keep working through it. And just making some slight adjustments and improvements has already, we've already seen, I should have shown these slides, the improvement in our outcomes um, for children of color and 
people feeling better about the organization and where we're headed. So I will leave you with that. One last question, Suzanne. Would you mind sharing uh, and celebrating with us one of your successes, something that from an outcomes point of view has moved positively for you, even if it's not as far as you want? Because I, I think it's important to understand that we need to celebrate each of these steps forward. And for the work you've done, you need to end on a note that that pinpoints that. Yeah, I'll sh you know, I always when I think about successes, I always think about individual kid and family successes. But then there are also a, there's also a system um, success. But you know, for one individual success that I think you know we celebrate and will continue to celebrate is we did have a child that was receiving services. Um, that was in foster care, had been in foster care way too long, um, came to Presley Ridge. Um, we had done a racial equity tracer on that child because we noticed the, the things that were happening weren't in line with what we thought should be decided within the court system. And they were actually getting ready to um, send this child out of state versus um, looking at the family family that this child had that he could be reunited with. Um, this child had been in care for quite some time. And what we were seeing were behaviors escalating because the child felt like there was no hope for the future um, of even being back with their biological family. Make a long story short, staff advocated, they showed some of the, the work that we're doing, showed some of the data. We said, give us three months, give us three months of in-home services, we'll let you know. We were able to do that. The child was reunited with his family. Child's doing well, and we're continuing to follow the case. Um, and when I think about the alternative there of that child actually going to a higher level care and leaving the state where his family was, I can't, you know, for that child, that was significant. And we cannot let ourselves be desensitized to the one child, one family that we can help. Um, but that's that's you know one case of that. The other piece of that that I would share that was systemic was the executive that we have in one of our states has been instrumental in promoting this work with the justice system. And what the court system is starting to see is that um, the inequities and disparities for African-American children in the juvenile justice system, children not receiving prevention services, going straight to corrections, and they've formed kind of a special committee to start to look at their data. That's a huge systemic success for us. Um, so I'll just leave you with those two things. Um, but, but yeah, we celebrate both of those. Um, we're proud of those. Very good. As you should be. And I heard the emotion in your voice. You can tell that this is this is very personal. Um, and as you noted, uh, it, it's a cultural shift. And I and we've we've had some wonderful conversations leading up to today. You shared a, a wonderful process of how your organization has started on your journey. Um, and we hope to hear back and continue to hear how the journey goes. Um, more of these amazing outcomes in the future with, with Presley Ridge. So I hope to do a follow-up someday with you. Uh, and then thank you both for presenting. Thank you all for attending. As a reminder, the presentation and the slides will be available on the Open Minds website um, under our Elite Executive Roundtable series in the Open Minds Library. And we invite you to join us next Thursday, February 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern time for the next in our series, which is maximizing revenue, aligning internal growth strategy, and succeeding in value-based care and Open Minds Executive Seminar on Marketing Strategies, which will feature our Open Minds Senior Associate, Casey Zanetti, and our Chief Marketing Officer, Tim Snyder. This is a special two-hour session. We will give a short break in the middle. Um, so that everyone can stretch their legs. And it is part of next week's Performance Management Institute, which you still have time to register and attend um, down in sunny Florida. Uh, for a full list of upcoming roundtables to register for February 10th, as well as future roundtables, please visit our Open Minds website. And we hope that all of you take a few of the tips that Susan has provided and see how you can begin to look at the culture of your organization. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.